Thank you all for coming here today. My name is Rob Holcomb. I'm the president of the SPIE chapter. And along with the Alliance for Diversity in Science and Engineering, we're excited to host Professor Linford Goddard. He is um, a professor in ECE at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, but he also is an advocate for underrepresented groups in science and engineering. He um, is a founding member of the IDEA Institute at the University of Illinois and is currently a associate dean for diversity and equity and inclusion at the Granger College, which is the University of Illinois uh, engineering school. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Dr. Winfrey Goddard. Thank you, Ross, for the introduction, and thank you for the invitation, um, especially the student chapter for SBIE, and also, I hopefully get the name correct, the Alliance for Diversity and Inclusion in STEM, or in Science and Engineering. Pretty close. Yeah. Pretty close. Okay. So thank you again for the invitation. Um, today, I'll be talking about what we're doing at the University of Illinois, um, how we've managed to build a college ecosystem for being able to do sustainable work. Um, one of the big challenges that you'll find if you work in this field long enough is that um, interest comes and goes and that there are people who are passionate about it. Um, and you really wanna empower the people who are passionate to be able to make impact and to do so in a sustainable way. Um, the big questions are always about, yes, you've been able to make improvements in certain areas, but how can you sustain it? So I'll talk about what we're working on. So I'll give some quick definitions of some core values. Um, uh, I think students are very well attuned to what these things mean. Um, normally when I talk to faculty and to staff, um, there's kind of a varying uh, understanding of these different concepts. So I'll just talk about these anyway. Um, I'll talk about our ecosystem for DEI, how it consists of many different parts working together um, with different starts and goals. Um, one of the big things that I'll focus on is just talking about the different programs that we offer and how the different uh, efforts support um, all the way from pre-college through professional development of faculty and staff. Um, and then I'll get into uh, talking about this new institute that we formed in 2019 called the Institute for Inclusion, Diversity, Equity, and Access. Um, I'll give some overview of the activities that we do as an institute. Um, we are a research institute, so our focus is understanding best practices based on data and based on scholarly publications in the field. Um, and then I'll talk about a unique program that we have as part of IDEA Institute called the GIANT program, which is the grassroots initiatives to address needs together. So there's a lot of acronyms that are floating around. Hopefully I'll be able to explain each of these um, to you. And then I wanted to end with just having a little bit of a discussion with the audience, uh, both in person and the people who are on Zoom, um, to better understand where Rochester is in terms of its goals and sort of the directions that it's thinking. Okay, so some definitions of core values. Um, I'm going to do this representation um, in terms of groups and talk about individuals and groups. Um, these are going to be represented by dots. Um, don't infer anything too much from the colors of the dots that I've chosen. Um, but this allows us to talk about different core values. Um, so you can see that this particular group, um, all the dots are green. So it's a homogenous group. Um, all the groups are, are pretty much the same according to this one label. And when we talk about these dimensions or when we talk about these concepts, uh, we have to keep in mind that there are different dimensions. And so just because there are a certain group that all seem the same in one of the dimensions, they may be quite diverse or different in another dimension. But shown here, since these are dots and we are all, all the dots are circular, all the dots are green, um, this group is not diverse. Um, when we think about ways in which um, different groups interact, um, there can be exclusionary or inclusionary type behaviors. So shown here, there's this exclusionary type picture where there's the group, which is the core group um, of the green dots. And there are other groups of uh, characteristics um, that are excluded from that core group. Um, this can form in many different ways. Um, some ways that you're familiar with from history of the US is segregation. So the different groups can be clustered in certain areas. They can be um, uh, homogenous in their own area, um, but not really interacting. Um, we can think about what happened in history. In history, we had integration. So the idea that um, you have to have schools that have both uh, Caucasian and African-American students in it, so just plop one group into another group, 
and that's what's known as integration. And that's not what we want. Um, we want the groups to really work together, to interact, to see each other as equals. Um, and so we want inclusion. We want the groups to essentially feel that they um, are included and that they belong with respect to each other. So those are some core concepts and core value definitions. Um, now I wanna talk a little bit about um, the difference between uh, equality and equity. Um, has, have people seen this slide before, like these pictures? Okay, so about half the audience has said yes. Um, so the idea of equality is that you give everyone the same exact resource. Um, and you can see this example, the kids are trying to watch the baseball game. Um, for equality, the kid who's tall doesn't really need the box, but can benefit anyway. The kid who's short, the box is not big enough, so that's not a useful solution. Um, instead, what you're striving for is equity, where everyone has the resources they need to succeed. And so you give the short kid uh, two sets of boxes and the tall kid um, doesn't need a box, and now they can all see the game and they can all participate. So the key with equity, um, when you think about it from an educational point of view, um, in terms of what an institution can do, it's really thinking about what practices are you implementing in the classroom or in the student support services or in the ways that your faculty and instructors are trained so that they are thinking about each individual student and making sure that the students have what they need to succeed. Um, there's something that's even better than uh, equity, which is liberation. So the idea that you're able to not just solve the problems for each individual, but you remove the underlying structural issue. Like why can the kids not see the game? Well, there's a fence that's up. So instead of spending the energy and the resources to build boxes for every single student, work on solving the underlying problem and removing the fence so that you have this liberation and everyone can see without needing these um, special aids. Um, you can see that there's a space on the, <laughs> on the diagram for one more thing. Any guesses as to what the fourth thing is that I'm gonna put up? Yeah. Watch a soccer game instead. Say it again? Watch a soccer game. Watch a soccer game instead of basketball or instead of baseball because it's more popular. Yeah. Good guess. <laughs> Other guesses? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so the last one that I'm going to put up is the idea of access. So we want people to not just sit on the sidelines. Um, we want to be able to enable those who have been historically marginalized or excluded from opportunities to actually be participating in these activities. So we want access for people so that they can be part of the game, essentially, that they have these educational opportunities, whether it's the opportunity to go to college, whether it's the opportunity to pursue a career in a field that they are typically not represented. So those are the core values that we're gonna talk about. And we typically abbreviate everything as DEI. So everything just gets lumped in as DEI, but what we mean by that are all of these concepts that we have um, inclusion, that we have access, that we have equity, that we remove structural barriers to liberate people so that they can really truly participate in the games. I know that's the... Say it again. You know, I sorry, it came in late, but this one has seen so many times, it's really good. Yes. <laughs> so I think pretty much the whole audience has seen the slide. So I think this is a key thing that um, people have stronger awareness of these concepts. Um, I think three years ago, five years ago, um, not a lot of people really understood the difference between equity and equality and the ideas of inclusion versus access versus removing structural barriers. So now I'll talk about our college's DEI ecosystem. And we've been really fortunate to have gone through a perfect storm of events. Like there's a lot going on that's really allowing us to have adequate momentum to really make a difference this time. So in recent years, faculty, staff, and students have really started asking themselves, um, what am I doing in life? How can I really make a difference in society? How can I have impact and contribute to not just my own family, but thinking more about community and society as a whole. These events of 2020 with um, all the stuff that was happening in the country, um, just the inequities that are being laid bare, the stuff with police brutality, all of these things have really awoken um, people to uh, think about ways in which they can really make a difference and contribute. So there's the groundswell of interest from the faculty, staff, and students. Um, in the administrator levels, um, we've really been trying to empower people to be able to do these sorts of things that they're passionate about, finding ways to remove barriers so that the ideas that people have for solving these types of challenges 
can be implemented and that we give people time and resources to be able to do that. Um, we we're very fortunate that our university, so um, this is a multi-year process. Um, so maybe five years ago, there was a committee that was looking at diversifying Illinois. And they started thinking about ways in which to modify the criteria for promotion and tenure. So when you think about how do you get faculty to do something? Well, if it's in the job description, they're gonna do it. If you tell them they're gonna get tenure based on publica or publications, they're gonna focus on publications. If you tell them they need grants, they're gonna focus on grants. So the committee initially thought about ways in which you can look, look at the faculty member's contribution to diversity, equity, and access and inclusion. And so that committee met for two years. They created a set of drafts of ideas on how you can evaluate these things, how they can be part of a promotion and tenure package. And then the provost tasked a, or created a task force, and I was on that task force, um, that looked at four things. So one of the things was, um, how do we integrate diversity, equity, and inclusion into the promotion and tenure criteria? Um, how do we evaluate team contributions? So a lot more science is interdisciplinary, a lot more engineering is interdisciplinary. So how do you evaluate a faculty member's contribution when they're part of a team? Um, how do you deal with faculty misconduct? So if something happens while they're going up for tenure, um, how do you make sure the process is still fair, but that it respects the um, rights of the individuals who are uh, filing the complaints? And then the fourth thing that we looked at was, um, how do you evaluate teaching effectiveness? So in the past, it's always been, well, the students say that the person's a good teacher, so they get, they get good scores, but that's kind of known to have um, discriminatory effects. There's biases against women, people of color, people who have uh, uh, international accents. There's, they're typically graded lower on their teaching just because of the way students um, perceive their, their teaching. Whereas if you have peer evaluation where people are looking at, well, exactly how are they using um, standard approaches or known approaches? How are they innovating in their teaching methods? How are they able to get their learning outcomes conveyed to their students and how are the students doing? Um, those ratings are, are very different than students' ratings, which are a lot about popularity. So we went through these revisions and one of the great outcomes was that we are now evaluate contributions to DEI in the annual review, in the three-year review, and in promotion and tenure. It's going to roll out. It takes a year or two to get the people who were hired under different criteria through the system so that we can evaluate this or uh, have this fairly. Um, and then the next major thing has been the changes in ABET. So the accreditation for engineering um, now has two components. One is that faculty uh, at the institution need to know about what the policies of the institution are towards DEI and what their role is in implementing initiatives to be able to be successful. Additionally, from the student point of view, I believe the criteria is that students need to be able to work on diverse teams and they need to be able to um, understand how diversity and inclusion um, are essentially like how what they do in their daily lives um, impacts diversity and inclusion. So though, all those things together means that there's a lot of people who are motivated to do something. There's enabling from the campus, from the departments, from the colleges, there's external pressure from ABET, and there's this internal change about promotion and tenure criteria. So based on that, plus additionally in 2020, we had our, I think it's a five-year strategic plan that we typically do. Um, we created a strategic plan which had six major thrusts. So things like growing the research enterprise, improving teaching and learning outcomes, um, improving recognition of the University of Illinois. Um, one of the six themes was making diversity, equity, and inclusion ubiquitous in everything that we do. So instead of having just like one or two people who work on DEI, we want everyone in faculty, staff, and students to be thinking about what are they doing in their day-to-day -day operations in their job that are promoting or inhibiting um, diversity, equity, and inclusion. So because it's part of the strategic plan, there's internal resources, there's internal um, accountability that these are things that are important to us. So we have a five pillar base of our DEI ecosystem. It can't just be a single person. And so what we have is we established in 2017, um, then Dean at the time, Andreas Cangelaris, who became provost, and now he's uh, president of a university in um, the Middle East. 
Um, he created a diversity committee to advise him on all matters pertaining to DEI um, that the college uh, uh, interfaces with. So what we do in our pre-college work, what we do with our undergraduate and graduate students, how we work with faculty and staff. And this diversity committee would have representatives from some of the different departments, plus some engineering administrators, to be able to talk about what are the fundamental issues that are coming up what should the university be thinking about investing? What directions do we need to improve? So that committee launched in 2017. Um, the Institute for Inclusion, Diversity, Equity, and Access was one of the outcomes of the recommendations of the diversity committee. So in the second year of the diversity committee, uh, there was discussions about, okay, we have this advisory body which tells the dean and tells the departments, these are the things you should be working on. But how do the departments and the college know what the best practices are? We need a body or an, ent an entity that's going to study the literature to understand what are the best practices, what are the things that other universities are doing, what are industry doing, what's going to be effective, and then be able to measure the outcomes of the initiatives that we do. So there was an investment to launch the Institute for Inclusion, Diversity, Equity, and Access. So we have lots of acronyms. So it's the IDEA Institute. Um, you got to be clever with your acronyms so that people uh, remember them. And the institute, which I'm the director of, um, I was the founding director, um, it focuses on uh, research and collaboration to understand different practices and whether they're effective. So it's really focusing on policies and practices and procedures and thinking about ways that the university can create programming to support um, the various DEI efforts. There are departmental DEI committees now for all 12 of our engineering departments. So we have um, the typical engineering departments you think of, but also computer science and physics are part of engineering. Um, agricultural and biological engineering and chemical engineering are also, they're affiliates in engineering, but all 12 departments have each formed their own departmental level diversity committees. And these committees are working at um, things that are specific to their department, but they also collaborate across departments to share best practices. Um, I was appointed as associate dean for DEI, and in this role, I'm responsible for implementing. So the diversity committee is advising, the IDEA Institute is research, associate dean position is to implement, and then the department level committees um, work on departmental level specifics. Um, we also appointed a dean's fellow in inclusion, belonging, and engagement to really study how can we have um, a model that was tested out in computer science about how do you report concerns and get feedback and advice on how to solve difficult challenges that may or may not be DEI, but it's sort of how do you deal with um, uh, situations um, before escalating things fully to the campus type things? Like how do you have someone who can hear the concerns and then give you advice as to where to go and what resources to have? So Tiffany Williams has this role of Dean's Fellow where she's taking this model which was developed in computer science and expanding it throughout the college so that everyone in the college knows, okay, I can go to this committee, um, the college-wide committee or these different groups, and they can advise me where to go next with my specific concerns. And then we have a lot of different offices in the undergraduate programs office and the graduate programs office that have been running long-term initiatives and long-term programs that focus on all, all different populations. And so there's a lot of efforts that we do that I'll show in the next slide. And so just a disclaimer, um, so uh, sometimes I give this presentation and there's someone from Illinois that said, you forgot to list our program. And I'm like apologizing because we just have so many different things because we're a really large college. I should mention um, our college, it's 10,000 undergraduate students, uh, 6,000 grad students, 1,000 staff and 500 faculty. So huge, huge department, sizes of, of major universities and others in other places. And we're about a quarter of the size of the whole U of I system. Yes, question. Yes, to clarify. So you would, uh, can, I, can I say that your role is like the executive branch of a government? Yeah, so as associate dean, it's to execute the uh, diversity plan of the college. So coordinating with the departments, but then also interfacing with the campus, um, because at the campus level, there's coordination across the different colleges, and there's a lot of efforts that the campus leads across the entire campus. And so I'm interfacing with the campus, with the departments, at the college level, but then also with individuals. Yeah. And uh, just 
out of curiosity, who tells you what to execute? Who decides what? Yeah, so the um, diversity committee has certain set of recommendations that they want to implement and things that they feel is important. And the diversity committee now is in our bylaws as a required standing committee. So there's representatives from every department on the college level diversity committee. So they're one of the primary sources of, of, of advising. Um, the dean also interfaces with the unit heads and they have feedback that they get and they give to me as to things to also work on. And then Idea Institute as a research entity has certain things that it says, these are great practices. And then I have my own ideas. So those four things together kind of guides the directions in which we execute. No, the questions are great. And I should say, um, I'll have plenty of time for the whole thing. So definitely ask questions while we're going, because um, I don't think I have an hour's worth of content. <laughs> so how do you prioritize? Because you're getting suggestions from four directions. You're not talking about the prioritization scheme. Yeah, so the prioritization scheme is it's a trade-off of what's the easiest to implement and what will have the most impact. So as I start thinking about um, proposals that come in and ideas that come in, I have to look at what sort of resources are going to be necessary, staff time, faculty time, financial commitment, um, what sort of impact it'll have, and whether it'll be sustainable. So a lot of the decisions on what to focus on just it, it's just sort of it's sort of, it, it, it's really a lot of reaction, but we have a lot of strategic planning. So like we had the 2020 strategic plan, which talks about DEI, but we've also so there's a program ASWE um, uh, Dean's Recognition Program ASDRP. Um, so that program um, it asks you to write a diversity plan. So we just went through that exercise this um, this fall. Um, and we got selected for what's called bronze status renewal. So we were bronze status before, we were applying for silver status, we got bronze status renewal instead. Um, but what they look at is you write out your diversity plan and you state what your priorities are and what your resources are and so forth. So that exercise actually was a prioritization exercise that we went through where we got input from the diversity committee, we got input from the dean, we also got input from um, a lot of the constituents who are um, representing the different units. And so that sort of set, okay, the things that we wanna focus on this semester. So this semester we're focusing, there's a campus level climate survey. So we're participating in that, but there's also a separate climate survey that we're also participating in. So surveying was one of the key things because we haven't done a climate survey in like 10 years. Um, another key thing is training for pro promotion and tenure committees. So the PNT committees that are evaluating candidates on these new criteria, as well as um, the um, existing biases, removing those from the, the evaluation process, that was a focus area. Um, faculty searches was also a focus area, just looking at, um, we wanna diversify our faculty, this is sort of the status quo. If we keep going in this direction, we're not gonna get where we wanna go. So what are strategies that we can share across departments to build the diversity of the applicant pool and then ensure that the candidates uh, progress through the, the committee. So those sorts of things, it's like there was discussion a little bit before, and then when we did the, the strategic plan for this year for that ASWE, it really said, okay, this is what we were focusing on this year. And we actually identified there were a few recommendations from past committees that we haven't implemented. And we said, oh, that was a really great idea. And it's not that hard to do. We really need to, to revisit that and, and to do it. So um, those have been the focus. There's also been focus on staff professional development. There's a lot of faculty professional development. You have the students that have classes, they get professional development. Staff have been sort of left out of that process. So how do we ensure that our staff are able to continue to proceed um, and build their competencies, not just technical, but also competencies related to soft skills, DEI type concepts. Um, what are the pathways that, that people can get proficient in that? So providing those opportunities, yes. I'm sorry if anyone else has questions, please do. And if you want to stop my questions, I, it was very interesting how you said it. And now I have a very different question. Mm -hmm. I have worked in some organizations before, maybe as student activity committees or student uh, councils. What I felt that is that sometimes you take up ideas and then when you try implementing them, you sort of realize it's not so easy to implement or this takes too much time. So yeah. you constantly need to keep updating. And one something you said you have a set. So how often do you go back and so you had some goals you took us took up some goals you tried them but it's also important that you go back and then one reevaluate how successful you were in implementing it 
but to also let go of the ones maybe that are not easy to implement. Yeah. So how do you do this process of what, you know, with so, with so many efforts and if you have to be much more better, you definitely do it. So I just want to know in an organization that you're heading, how you go. Yeah, so we, we do that every year. So there's a process where, um, so as an associate dean, um, I write up, these are the things that we said in our strategic plan we were going to work on. Yeah. Um, these are the resources it'll take. And then for the next year, so every year the associate deans propose these are the focus areas that we want, and these are the resources we need. So um, it's almost like we're writing an internal proposal, like we want to do these three DEI things. Um, how much of the college's budget can we get to do these things? Whereas the research associate dean is like, we want to do these things. And then the communications want to do these things. So we write up our progress against the strategic vision. And we say, OK, these are the things we want to do. And we have to do some ranking to say, OK, we want to invest our resources in things that are going to benefit and have huge impact. And so we evaluate based on how much it costs in terms of time, resources, and um, financial commitment, and how much impact it will have. And then based on that, you sort of rank the ideas, and then you fund and, and decide to move forward with those Last things. question. Sure, yes. sure. Is your success metric defined before the moment you make the focus, or is it after the year? It tends to be after, and that's not an ideal thing. Ideally, you define the metric and what you're trying to aim for, because then that affects the things that you implement. But we have the sort of vision that you want to be excellent. And so it doesn't matter if you hit some specific metric. You can kind of tell if you're excellent at doing something. And as long as you're aiming for excellence rather than some specific metric, then that's that's the outcome. Thank you. Thank you very much for it. You're welcome. Okay. Other questions? Yeah. Um, I, I, I appreciate the, the details about the structure of, of these organizations. I'm just curious, can you give specific examples or will you be later in your presentation mm -hmm. giving specific examples of what kinds of programs you're talking about implementing? Sure. What, what these different systems that you're putting into place actually look like you know, in practice. Yeah. So I'll spend a lot of time talking about um, the Idea Institute and the GIANT program. Um, but I'll give an example for the College Level Diversity Committee. So this year, um, the College Level Diversity Committee, one of the major efforts was coming up with this three-year plan. Like, this is what we want to focus on. These are the objectives and so forth. Um, one of the other things that we've looked at is um, sort of the lines of reporting. So this is getting back to that model of um, there's a student with a concern. What are the resources for the student? Where does the student go? Um, who do they trust and who do they go to? So building up capacity, so training staff so that they are um, uh, welcoming in the way that they respond to student concerns. So that was one of the directions for the departmental, for the college level diversity committee. Mm -hmm. The departmental level ones, um, right now they're, they're doing various, they're just all, they're doing all sorts of things depending on what their department needs. Um, I'm on the ECE's uh, uh, diversity committee. And what we're mostly talking about these days, um, there was some climate survey data that we did for our undergraduate students and certain concerns that were brought up. So for example, um, there was some large number, I forgot what the percentage of, of students who just didn't have never been to office hours. And so us as faculty are like, well, why are our students not going to office hours? Is it that they don't know about it? Is it that um, faculty are not welcoming? Is it that there's not good scheduling and so forth? So we started looking at that problem is like, why don't students go to office hours? There was also um, the, we have this undergraduate research program track. And so a lot of students ask, how do I get to do undergraduate research? But we have this entire seminar, which is a one, at, one credit hour course that basically students are presenting their research so other students can understand what it means to do research. And there was some really huge number who also have never heard of this program. So it's just sort of, um, and, and it's like disproportionate for different populations like first generation students. It's significantly more prominent than students who have uh, a legacy. So just understanding when there are discrepancies and inequities, um, what sorts of things can departments do to level the playing field, but also provide um, information and resources to students who may not necessarily be in the know. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. I wonder if you have made any collaboration with HKN at DC 
um, with HKN. So Idea Institute has not. Um, yeah, we've not. I'm trying to think if any of the DEI efforts have not. Um, we've not, but the GIANT program, they can apply for it. And I'll explain what the GIANT program is. Um, so let me show the program's chart. So we have this really complicated set of programs that until I created this chart, like half, half of the staff didn't know about all of the programs. Like we just have so many things that we're doing and there's all these different silos and students and faculty just don't know about the stuff that we do all the way from uh, pre-college through professional. So we wanna engineer for diversity and societal impact and we wanna do it through sustained programming. So we wanna have programs that run year after year decade after decade so that people really understand um, that this is a resource. Um, this is gonna be a confusing chart as things come up, but I have this legend at the side. So um, stuff that's in solid boxes are diversity focused, dashed lines are diversity aware, and then the different colors mean uh, whether it's mentoring or classes or research and so forth. So in the pre-college space, um, our programs are run through the Worldwide Youth Science and Engineering Program. We have a program, so lots of acronyms, Program Chicago uh, Science and Engineering, um, which is an organization, it's a local org in Chicago. And we partner with them to do family-centric mentoring and engineering exposure. So we work with families um, on Saturdays, uh, undergraduate students go to Chicago, it's a two and a half hour drive. Um, and then they run a workshop for that afternoon and it's engineering focused or it might be math focused. Um, we have summer camps. So this year we have 24 summer camps. So these are one week programs run by a department. So like um, uh, aerospace will run a one week camp where they study aerodynamics and the students actually go in a plane and they, because we have a, a, a university airport um, and they fly the plane for like uh, five minutes as part of the, the process. So they learn enough that they, they're taking control, but there's of course the, the main pilot who can override if they're gonna do something that's not quite safe. Um, so we have these camps and they're ranging from middle school to high school. Most of them are one week long. There's some that are gonna be explore your options where you try a different major each different day. And they're actually two weeks long because there's a virtual version of it, but most of these are in person. Anyways, there's a large number of camps that we offer. Um, there's System 365, which I'm the PI on. It's a NSF project to work with teachers and counselors across the state of Illinois. Um, we want to be able to, uh, so we work with an organization called the National Alliance for Partnerships in Equity. They do a lot of engineering education and equity training. So they work with the teachers and counselors on how they can do uh, inclusive teaching practices and how they can um, be able to um, have students have growth mindset and thinking about the psychology of learning. So they work with the teachers and counselors to take ideas from the literature and implement them in their classroom or in their counseling. And then I work on the technical side. We want to have these schools, which are low resource schools, um, be able to offer the opportunities that are similar to our summer camps. So we wanna take our summer camp curriculum, give it to the schools, have the schools do it throughout the year as like an after school club. So they can have like an engineering club at a school that doesn't typically have after school activities. And then the third part of it is the students from those schools, we give them scholarships to attend um, our summer camps. We have the Granger Engineering Young Scholars Program. And so this is two high school students plus their teacher. They spend six weeks doing research at uh, the U of I and they get paid a stipend. Um, in the undergraduate space, we directly admit students to our programs. We also have a very extensive pathways program. So partnership with 12 community colleges across the state where if the students finish the community college program, they automatically get admission into our very highly selective programs. Um, we've since expanded this to not just be 12 community colleges, but now we've announced something that's statewide. So any community college, provided they meet certain um, criteria, um, they can send their students directly. We have a gear up program, which is for uh, community college transfers to get acclimated to the U of I. Um, we have a grant called the Arise program, and this is something we're trying to sustain now that the grant is, has ended. Um, this is the academic red shirt in science and engineering. So just like in sports, you have a red shirt football player who um, is on the team, but they're not playing the game just yet because they're learning the system. We have that sort of thing for students where they're spending a five-year program. Year one, they're building up um, some core competencies and they're building community. And then in years two through five, they're continuing with their education um, to complete their engineering degree. 
We have the Moral Engineering Program and the Women in Engineering. So these are college level staffed uh, organizations that help students from underrepresented minorities or women. Um, so it supports and mentorship. Um, we have a lot of student organizations. So National Society of Black Engineers, Society of Women Engineers, Society of Hispanic and Professional Engineers, out in STEM, Society for Advancement of Chicano and Native American uh, students, um, Engineering Ambassadors, and Graduate Engineers Diversifying Illinois. So lots of student organizations um, that are focused on DEI. Um, or we have uh, Granger First Year, where some of the projects that they do for the first year uh, projects are service projects. We also have social justice or service learning courses. So there are courses where students go into Chicago public schools and they work with the teachers and counselors to understand the challenges and then develop um, learning uh, opportunities um, that, are, that are outside of what they typically do. Um, I'm gonna skip some of these. Um, the next main one is um, in the graduate space. Um, we have a program um, for CS, so people who've done majors outside of CS to do a CS master's degree. Um, we have support for students from underrepresented groups. And then we have a program to help first year PhDs who want to go into faculty positions to kind of get started. And then for fourth and fifth year PhDs to um, polish and uh, improve their, their applications and understand what it means to be a, a faculty member. Um, professional space, the IDEA Institute does research. We have A3, which works with teachers to improve the way that they teach. And then we have the Engineering Future Leaders Forum, which is a discussion of people who've just gotten full professor to think about their next phase in their career, like are they gonna go into some leadership role? So that's sort of the, the landscape that we have of sustained programs that run year after year. Okay, let me jump into the IDEA Institute. So the IDEA Institute founded in 2019, um, the goal is to support scholarly research, to publish articles, to go to conferences, to talk about best practices in diversity, equity, and inclusion, and to think about this at all different levels that the college engages. I have a saying that in order for us to have impact at scale, we're a large university, in order for us to have impact at scale, we need many people working together towards a common goal. So we first have to define the common goal, we have to agree that this is our goal, and we have to rally people together and we have to have many people working on it. We can't just have a single person doing it. So the IDEA Institute, um, we've grown to over 250 members. And so we have a large, we have about a third of the members are students, a third are staff and a third are faculty. And we've been meeting every month since uh, February of 2020, um, mostly virtual, actually all virtual um, to discuss um, what, other, what people are working on because there's a lot of silos. So like people are doing really great things in their own units, but how do you spread that idea across a college? Um, we've been discussing trends. We've been thinking about best practices. We've been thinking about what are the policies and priorities that we have to focus on. Um, the grassroots initiative to address needs together. So this is the one I'll talk about more. This is a very unique program. So the idea behind this program is we wanna have teams led by students or led by staff or led by faculty to work with a specific population. So students may say, I see a problem. The problem is we don't have mentorship for students from underrepresented groups in their sophomore year. And that's a very important year because it leads to summer internships and their pathway to grad school. So the grad students will get together and they'll write a proposal. It's a two page proposal. So very, very short explaining what the initiative is gonna be, why it's gonna work, um, they're gonna explain what's been done in the literature, why is this new, or why is this a best practice that they're adopting? And then they uh, can apply for $13,000 in funding for a one-year pilot program. And that funding can be used for travel, it can be used for doing research studies, it can be used to pay undergraduate uh, assistance or graduate assistance. Um, it can also be used for implementing program, like buying food or um, being able to have workshops or meeting space reservations. So then they do the initiative and a key part of their proposal is that they wanna study the impact that the initiative has. So they do research, so they formulate a research question that they wanna study. Will this program that I've created to mentor sophomore students change the views and outcomes of students in the program compared to a control population? They have to write an IRB statement. So uh, institutional review board, they get that approved and then they carry out the research and then they hopefully publish the results in a conference like ASWE. So these are engineering students who are leading projects that are on kind of social, but engineering and STEM related topics. 
and publishing and engineering education type outlets. So overall, we have 23 teams. We've funded about 350K across these 23 teams. There's about 100 members that are involved in at least one of these teams. So lots of people involved in these different efforts. And I'll, I'll give the list of the things that we do. Um, in 2020, we had the anti-racism seminar series, so lots of invited speakers. We also had a task force that created a set of recommendations that we've been working on implementing. So this is kind of like our strategic plan, but strategic plan for anti-racism type efforts. And then we've joined the Inclusive Engineering Consortium, which is a group of HBCUs and minority serving institutions, um, also with industry and predominantly white institutions to work together on how can we um, improve the quality, it's ECE specific. So how can we improve the quality of engineering education for electrical engineering and computer engineering? Okay, so this is some pictures from our poster session from 2022 Giant Spring Conference. So the teams that do their project research and then they come and they present and share ideas. Um, this is the list of the projects. Um, so the, I'm just gonna show all of them and then I'll explain. Um, so every year we fund about seven to 10 projects or so. Um, the ones in red are the ones that are led by graduate students. So you can see that we have six different projects that these are graduate students that said, I see a problem, I'm gonna write a proposal and I'm gonna carry out this initiative. Um, the first one was to build an allies program. So it's a collaboration between the graduate SWE uh, organization and um, SACNAS. Um, and so they created this workshop series for helping people to become allies. Um, the second one, the more effectively mentoring graduate students wanted to study what happens to CS graduate students um, where are they getting caught up in the process of going through graduation? Like, is it at the call? Is it formulating the research? How is their communication with their advisor? And then project number seven is a collaboration between the Nesby undergraduate chapter and the Graduate Engineers Diversifying Illinois. It's a mentorship type program. In year two, there was another mentorship program, but that one was with SHIP and um, I forgot what the other group was. It was SHIP and someone else. Um, and then in year three, there was one that's on uh, creating a roadmap for historically marginalized or underrepresented genders. So it's talking about like, how do you go through a career progression? Um, and it's really focused on women and uh, non-binary uh, students. And then there was a project where people realized for a freshman, for first year undergraduates, we have a lot of orientation programs, but there's nothing like that for graduate students. So how do we create a welcoming event, especially for women, um, so that they know that there's a community? And the one in blue is led by an undergraduate. So the undergraduate led program is probably one of the most successful ones out of these. Um, it's to create a program for American Sign Language. So teaching people um, through this app um, how to uh, do sign language. And then there are other projects that are led by staff that are community focused. There's ones that are by faculty that are looking at the ways that study partners form in a class and inclusive classes or inclusive partnerships where it's like two women and a man versus a man and two, or versus two men and a woman, um, how the different groups um, feel, like how do you feel a sense of belonging depending on the composition of the different groups. So lots of different ideas and projects that people have, have focused on. Um, so I'm gonna skip this, but this, these are kind of summaries of some of the things that were done in the first year. So the Allies in STEM program, they had a lot of students participate to learn about how to do or how to be an ally. Um, the undergraduate research, um, so there were students from groups that are in the ARISE program. So these are students who um, their parents most likely did not go, most likely didn't go to college. And so these students may not know that research as an undergraduate is something that they should be aiming for. And so they had a very low percentage or participation compared to students from other groups. So this was to create a program to help get them into undergraduate research. And it was very effective. They went from like 1% of the participants to 12% or 11% that were involved in research. And peer encouragement was a real main, main driving factor. Um, the CS uh, for PhD students, they wanted to understand where's the disconnect between faculty expectations and student expectations, and how is it different depending on if the student's from an underrepresented group. 
And so their findings they presented at ASWE conference, they also shared with the department and the department is now thinking about ways that they can change some of their policies um, about the timing of like the qualifying exam and also the ways that students get mentorship between their qual and their prelim. So qual is second year, prelim is fourth year for us. Um, how do students get supported in that, in that gray area that students feel like uh, there's not clear expectations as what I'm supposed to do as a researcher? Um, there's a science program that's working with families um, in the local community. So it's taking some of the models that exist in the Chicago program, making it local to the Champaign-Urbana and partnering with some local community organizations to be able to run these programs. Yeah. I have a very serious, intense question for sure. a bit out of this, but I feel like you will have some very insightful ideas about it. Sure. Uh, I'm from India and I came here and I'm studying more about the culture here and I'm interested. And something that I've become cognizant about recently is the model minority problem. How when people are successful and even underprivileged people, a few of them, the possibility of them succeeding is low, but when they are successful, they're used as a pedestal to not give enough resources to underprivileged sections of society. If that person from this underprivileged section could do it, you can also do it if you work hard enough. And how privileged or you know powerful sections of society deny, still deny all of these accesses to these, uh, to these places using this model minority problem. Mm -hmm. And to demonstrate this further, how much people need to do it, just so I want everyone to be, everyone else also to understand my question. I think Charles Barkley, the basketball player, he said in an interview that when he went to a black school, he he was sort of sad that every student, what they wanted to do in life, even though he was a bit heavy, he was really sad that everyone wanted to be a, a sports player, because that is the only place where they see a black person succeeding. And he was, also, he was sad that no one wanted to be an engineer or thought about success in terms of becoming an engineer or in terms of becoming a doctor in their big dreams. And this was not the case if he went to a privileged school. And in that sense, one, I just want to say that uh, Charles Bakke would be really proud that, you know, you are serving as a role model to all of these people. But just to illustrate how much you still need to do from underprivileged sections of society for them to feel that they, they also have the capability to dream outside of maybe not just sports, but also they can be successful in all of these things, academy and all of that stuff. And in other sense, and even with all of these good intentions, I feel, and I'm being very direct, and I don't want to be, no, it's great to be. Yeah. You are also, in a sense, building a modern minority here. Uh -huh. Some that's, that even with all of these good intentions, when they go out, because they needed maybe all of this more help, but when they go out into the world and become successful, some people are going to point at them and tell if those people could become successful. And it sort of absorbs a lot of responsibility from people in, in within power to help these people. So one thing is, how do you view this problem? How do you overcome? How do you think as a society we overcome this problem? And secondly, I, I feel, and, and if I was in your position, I would be thinking that people who benefited from these programs specifically to try to it also had a responsibility back to these communities in some sense. And, and what do you think those responsibilities are? How do you, how, what is some, what is the future goal of someone, in your opinion, who benefited from these programs? And how do you do all of this, but, but still try to avoid the model minority problems, you know, like how you don't let them become like a pedestal where, like in the US system, just to make everyone clear, I, sorry, I sometimes over explain my questions, okay. you know, like in poorer neighbor, the local schools are funded from the money in the neighborhood. And if you live in a poor neighborhood, you living in an under-resourced school. Okay. And so how much, you know, the, uh, I think the structural systems are against you, something that is sort of forgotten by a lot of people. How do you view this problem? How do you view the model minority problem that arises? How do you view, what is the responsibility of someone who takes advantage of the system? And what do you think is our, should be our goal as a society moving forward? Yeah, excellent questions. Um, so let me sort of put together some of the thoughts. Um, so the very first thing about the model minority, um, it's definitely a problem because I think people don't envision sort of the C plus or the C minus minority student as a success. Yes, yes. And you have to realize that there, the student that gets a C plus or C minus and graduates, yeah. that's a success. That's a student that's graduated. Yeah. So sort of, you have a few people that get the A yeah. and you're like, okay, every single minority, if you wanna succeed in this, you need to get the A. Yeah, exactly. But you don't say that about the overrepresented population. There are students that get C's and D's and you still get jobs. 
So there has to be a mindset that um, we want to increase the access and increase the success of all students throughout the spectrum. It can't just be you have one or two superstars and you've done your job. You have to be able to bring up a large number of people that are successful. So I think being able to look at you have enough people that are succeeding, then you get out of that model minority. That sort of you have one person who succeeded and therefore everyone should be looking at being like the perfect case. Um, I think your other point about the model minority is that um, people who say, oh, they were able to succeed, so we don't need to do anything. Yeah. They don't really see the systems that are in place that were propping up that student or propping up that person as they're developing. You asked about my long-term goal. My long-term goal is to not have a job in this position. So I need to work, yeah, I need to work on how do I dismantle the structural issues so that these types of support programs are not needed. So that's that picture again with um, the difference between equity and liberation. Right now, some of these programs, these initiatives, they're focusing on equity, get the students what they need so that they're successful, but they're not addressing the underlying systemic issue. And that's part of what Idea Institute is working on and part of what I'm working on as associate director is what are the specific obstacles? What are the specific barriers that are causing us to have this disproportional impact? For example, is it the requirement that we have a GRE? So the GRE, um, it benefits students who are rich because they can take the preparation classes, they can take the GRE multiple times. Yeah. So requiring a GRE as part of your graduate admissions is inherently privileging students who have those sorts of resources. So what sort of policies like that can we work on to remove structural inequities so then we don't need as many support programs? There's a difference between short-term and long-term. The support programs are really good at short-term, they're really good at individuals. They help individuals to get to that next step. But long-term, unless there's a steady flow of funding to run it, um, long-term, it's not gonna be a solution. So a better strategy is to work on the structural issues, fix that, so then you don't have to invest as many resources in these sorts of support programs. I wonder if there's any number of uh, uh, space reserved for those uh, underrepresented uh, group of people, because from my opinion, like from my experience at U of I, that, um, when lots of people wants to transfer to EC and CS because, and also I feel like those students, they feel more privileged than other departments. So uh, when I was in undergrad, I feel like most people wants to transfer to these two departments. And uh, the fact is they only based on your uh, GPA over the first year. So if you don't get a good GPA, uh, then you're very unlikely to transfer into these departments. And do you have a number of, space reserved for, no. for those underrepresented. No, so the, the question you're asking is, is there a quota? Like, is there a specific yes. number set aside? The answer is no. Um, so the general admission, um, they set targets for the total class size. So there is sort of a quota on the total number of students that can be, but not from a specific group. So a department will say, we can handle 600 new undergrads. And the admissions committee starts admitting people. Some people accept, some people decline or whatever. Um, and they hope that the actual number of students that show up is 600. Um, and there'll be fluctuations, but for specific groups, there's not. Your question about transferring between departments, like there are some departments now, computer science no longer accepts internal transfers. So oh. yes, you have to actually get into the major because there's just too much demand. Um, ECE still allows transfers, but there isn't a specific space set aside. The only exception is that students that are admitted to the ARISE program, they've technically been admitted to our college so, but they haven't picked their major. So there are spaces for those students to go into whatever major that they want, but the number of such students is very small. It's 25 per year compared to the class is 2000. So we just make tiny bits of space in each department that if a student from the ARISE program who's been admitted and normally we would just put them in the department, but we don't want them to fail right away. They start off in ARISE and then they go into that. So coming from Illinois to, to here, the biggest difference is obviously the scale, scale of operation, the number of people, size of the campus. Um, are there, given all this work you've done, you know, with, with so many people involved, so much funding and, and um, efforts involved, are there takeaways that uh, that you've published or, or are out there that a school like, you know, a place like this could implement given we don't have all the resources to put all these teams together. Yeah. What are the top five things a place top like this should do? Yep. 
All right, so number one takeaway, there needs to be graduate to undergraduate peer mentoring. So um, undergraduate students don't always know what it's like in graduate school, especially students from underrepresented backgrounds. So setting up something where there's graduate students mentoring undergraduate students, that would be my number one recommendation. Number two recommendation is sort of the, not professor but or staff, but sort of the mentoring of graduate students. So right now the two biggest thing is like, undergraduates don't know what to do, graduate students don't know what to do. There needs to be more support programs that build community for graduate students. So whether it's like social events, whether it's um, like talking about the research, professional development, graduate students, they get what they get in their classroom, they get what they get in their research, but that social belonging is missing. And undergraduate students, they have the social belonging because they have a lot of student organizations, but they don't have the mentorship and vision to go into um, classes. So a lot of the projects are actually solving that issue. Um, I want to go back to the list so that I remember the other main things. Um, community engagement. So the community engagement is probably the number three. Building strong, lasting relationships with specific community organizations. So when faculty members change or when students change, programs come and go, and the community gets tired of that. Um, you want to form a connection with a community organization who's dedicated and is gonna be sustaining these sorts of efforts. So not just like go into the community and say, I have the solution to your problem, work with the community organization, have the participants talk with the, the, the university, get mutual understanding, get good um, sense of like, what is the thing that we want to work on together rather than let's solve a problem. It's, we wanna to work together. What do we wanna work on? and have that community discussion and the community buy-in and have the community be the ones who are suggesting a lot of the solutions and the university is just sort of backing up with resources and, and capabilities. I would say those are the three biggest. It's like the undergraduate students, the graduate students and community engagement where the community feels like an equal um, partner. Sure. Just to clarify, you answered all of my questions except one for you. Okay, what was the one I missed? Uh, I asked you that uh, people, like, students from underprivileged sections who benefit mm -hmm. from oh, these, what's their responsibility? Yeah, and also anyone who, say, in the tradition, quote unquote, becomes successful, mm -hmm. what is their responsibility towards their communities? Yeah, I mean, morally, you should feel like I benefited from these programs. I should do at least the same for the next generation. It's this sort of um, passing it along. Um, you have to, and not everyone's going to feel that way and not everyone's going to be able to, to give it and that's okay. Um, you just want to have um, the people who've gone through the process who's benefited from it be uh, cognizant that they benefited from these types of programs and want to give back. And it could be time, it could be money, it could be um, expertise, so like just uh, discussions and so forth. And there are a lot of people who do that. The other main thing, which maybe this is probably number three or four in the list of important things, um, you want to get a large number of people doing it. The, the, the biggest challenge I see with a lot of these DEI efforts, it's like one person is really, really passionate about it, and then maybe they get like two or three people to follow along. And there's a saying that if you want to go uh, fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. So you need enough people that are going to be able to sustain the effort um, to be able to uh, be successful, because otherwise you're just going to burn out. So. Is it okay if I go beyond an hour? Yeah, um, people can feel free to leave if they need <laughs> okay. to go. Um, I also had a follow-up question. Uh, you were talking about scale, and it's amazing how many different programs you have going on. Have you found sort of an ideal size for each program where you're able to get things done um, yeah. while still not being buried in bureaucracy? Yeah, so let me give you a sense of sizes. So chi -C, it's roughly six faculty plus um, maybe five staff plus um, about 10 students, and it works with about 40 families. Um, the summer camps, it's 24 camps. Each camp is like two or three faculty plus two or three students, and then 24 high school students. Um, most of these other programs like the Arise MEP, so actually MEP is um, a thousand undergraduate students from who are Hispanic, African-American, or uh, uh, indigenous. And it's only three staff members that are working with these thousand students. And one of the big things that came out of the discussions is 
we definitely need to increase the staff size because it's just unsustainable to, to work with so many students. Um, they have mentoring meetings and they talk to the students because the students may not necessarily be from those backgrounds that know how to succeed in college. Women in engineering, so it's 20% of our 16,000 students are women. They're supporting huge numbers. And again, it's only like five people in that office. Um, each of these programs, so like uh, the undergraduate programs office, I think has like 70 staff total. And they run all of these programs, but then they also do academic advising for the general population. They do lots of other things, career services and so forth. Um, so in terms of size and scale, it's sort of, you want to have well-defined like scope of what you're focusing on. So like, it doesn't make sense to have one person doing career services and working with first year students and doing something else. Um, the specialization that you can get with scale um, really helps to say, okay, these are the things that we're focusing on and these are the staff that are working in there in that space. And then it's easier to increase the number of participants because this one person is just responsible for the program. Yeah. I think with a smaller institution, you may end up with staff that are doing these sorts of multiple different programs and that's where it gets really challenging. Yeah. In terms of funding all these programs, are these coming from external grants? I guess it's probably a mix of internal yeah. and external. It's a mix of external and internal college funds. So um, like so chai -C, it's actually um, a gift fund plus, um, I think it's gift fund plus internal college fund. So some of the staff that are, that are running these programs are just paid directly from the, the college. Um, but then like System 365 is a grant. The summer camps, actually there's tuition. So we charge the students, but there's a lot of scholarships for students who are from underrepresented groups. So then it's free for them to attend, but the other students will pay. Um, Idea Institute was an investment from the college. So it was a five-year investment on the order of $2 million to be able to get the, the program going, get staffing going, um, be able to offer the giant grants. Um, AE3 is like college funding, so it's, um, it's actually three professional staff, but then it's like a network of faculty who are passionate about teaching. So it's kind of people doing service as part of their, their faculty position. So it's just a really huge mix of like, is this volunteer work? Is this paid work? Is this <laughs> grant or is it gift? Are there uh, particular external funds, let's say from NSF, uh, that come to mind that would be appropriate for a smaller scale institution like ours. Yeah, so the, um, the, there's a lot of different NSF programs. Um, it depends on, are you focused on undergraduate or pre-college or professional development? Um, so the ones that, that come into mind, um, so the System 365 is what's called an I-Test, Innovative mm -hmm. Teaching Experiences with Technology. Um, and they have different size programs. So the one that we have is sort of the mid-size, it's a $1.2 million grant. They have a spread, which is like a nationwide thing, which is like 5 million. Um, and then they have these sorts of pilot ones, which are 400K. So you may wanna start off with a pilot one where you propose some initiative where you're gonna engage pre-college students with technology. So I test is pre-college. Mm -hmm. um, they have ones in the Department for Undergraduate Science and Engineering DUSC, I can't remember if that's what it stands for, um, but that program has, um, has, has funding for undergraduate program development. There's STEM, um, I forgot what that stands for, but it's like scholarships in STEM. Um, and then there are the larger ones like the NSF Includes Alliance where you're forming. And so a school like Rochester could join an alliance, in which case you're not doing the heavy lifting, but you're implementing something that's being implemented. Um, nationwide. Thank you. All right, let me jump back this way. All right, so we went through these examples. Forgot what else I had on the slides. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, so the discussion questions I had for you. And <laughs> so this is kind of getting in there. Um, what are the primary goals of, of Rochester for DEI? Like, what are you focusing on? And I think this question might be more appropriate for faculty, but maybe as students, like, what are the things that you want your university to focus on? Can I be honest? Sure. <laughs> it's recording, but go ahead. <laughs> I, I, I'm 
I'm it's also my biggest blessing and curse that I don't feel shy. Mm -hmm. Something I noticed when I came into our year was that in the Institute of Optics, very few students of African American descent. I mean, how are we solving that in India? When you have underprivileged sections of society, the government institution I studied in, 50 percentage of the seats are reserved for under underprivileged sections of society. Mm -hmm. So out of the 10,000 seats in the big, biggest university in the country, 5,000 seats are every year reserved for, I mean, there may be protests and about why they, from the privileged section, but I think it's a, I mean, I'm not saying it's the best way, but it is one way to address the problem. I'm thinking what, what is, I mean, we, we, are some, we are the most reputed, say, people want to say one of the most reputed optics, you know, community in the world. How many underprivileged sections of the society are we giving a chance to be here? Something I'm thinking about. Yeah. I can only name a few students of color in in the Institute of Optics. I don't know if that question was offensive. I, I but, don't uh, necessarily think that's a problem. It might be just there's no enough interest for some specific people. That might be a coincidence or maybe something else because even optic, I didn't know what optic is until like junior year. Right. There's, we only have like 15 people per year to accept it into the graduate program. So maybe the problem is then not with the Institute of Optics. It is about also then undergraduate education or, you know, why do we know about these institutions? Why do we aspire to be here? Why do people from those underprivileged sections are not here? I mean, then maybe it's not the Institute of Optics. There's something much more fundamental, but are we thinking about all of that? Yeah, so the, I think the, the question is, where in the process are, are we missing out? Like, yeah. where, where should we address? Yeah, I so uh, I agree with Haibo's points that it's, it's not just that the institution itself is limiting. Um, there has to be the demand and there has to be the interest. So the question is, um, students from backgrounds that don't have parents who have college degrees or that haven't been um, connected to a company that does optics, how do they learn about optics? Yeah, I is don't it, know. Is it, is it in their undergraduate? And then the question is, okay, how do they get into the undergraduate? Is it in the high school? So for my path, um, so I really got into optics in undergraduate. Um, in high school, I did um, French and Spanish and electronics and typing, and those were my electives. Um, and then in college, I did physics and math and also Japanese as a minor. But um, the passion about getting into optics didn't come until my senior year of, of college when I took um, Bob Byers class on lasers. And I was able to go in and, and do um, the spot of Virago experiments. That was like the coolest thing ever, like being able to see a bright spot when you shine a laser at a completely opaque object because of interference. And so that was like, I, I gotta get into this more, I gotta learn more about it. And then I was very fortunate that right after my undergraduate, I had an internship at um, Xerox Palo Alto Research Center where they were doing blue laser diodes and they were the second group in the world to be able to make a blue emitter behind Nakamura who eventually won the Nobel Prize for the blue laser. So I was like three years away from like the, <laughs> that sort of discovery, but just realizing that the opportunity to do research and this internship really shaped my career path. How do we get those sorts of transformative experiences to students who don't have those experiences? And that's part of the reason that those summer camps, so I have a summer camp for high school girls to get excited about electrical and computer engineering. That was my sort of giving back and my motivation as to why I wanted to do that type of camp is that I had an electronics class in high school and that electronics class in high school, I learned soldering, I learned circuits, I built things, I got hands-on exposure and experiences. And that led me towards the physics undergraduate degree. I was also thinking about, I had this internship opportunity where I was testing lasers and being able to measure things. So I was thinking about how can I get high school girls these sorts of similar opportunities so they can see that this is something that has societal impact 
it's fun, it's hands-on, I can build things, I can be creative. Um, and so that's one way that you can kind of address the problem. But again, that's a small scale thing. Like my program, it's 20 students a year nationwide and we do it for 10 years. So that's 200 students that may have been Amazing. impacted. Still a very, very small drop in the bucket. Amazing. Yeah, so how do you get more opportunities like that to different age groups? And then once they've had that opportunity, how do you make it so it's transformative? And then how do you follow it up so that they apply and they get in rather than they get really passionate about something and then they get turned away? So some of that is um, working with the teachers and counselors so that they can help prepare their students to be able to apply for university. Yeah. So your summer camp program, um, is there, a, like, there must be a standardized curriculum in place that you can do year to year and maybe transfer from you know whoever's leading that every summer is is that sort of in place and is that now being spread out to other universities or it's still very local um so the one that i developed um for the girls is what we're using for the system 365 which is the one with the teachers and the counselors at their school so that's an example of a curriculum where we did trial and error and it was really focused on hands-on project-based learning mm -hmm. trial and error a whole bunch of summers see what sticks with like which activities are really cool so we found out the cool activities going in the clean room to make your own solar cell mm -hmm. so they get a silicon wafer um they do spin on dopant they get to use the spinner um the graduate student puts it in the oven for them overnight the next day they go outside in the sun or sorry, they, they, they put on some conductive ink, they go out in the sun and they measure 0.3 volts, like really bad solar cell, but they get to measure it and they see something that they've created. So that was like, this is a slam dunk. We, we got to somehow figure out how to do this with, with other groups. Um, and so just trial and error, seeing what works and then thinking about how can you take those really great activities, those hands-on and disseminate it to more people. Um, we published a paper on one of the activities in a conference called ETOP, Education Topics in Optics and Photonics. So the activity was, it's a $2 project. Um, it does kirigami, so that's cutting and folding. And they basically cut and fold a V-groove so that it can hold a flashlight, a lens, a transparency, and a, um, oh, sorry, flashlight, a transparency, a lens. And the transparency that they have, it has certain dimensional features. So then they shine the light, it goes through the lens, it's geometrical optics, they measure the sizes of things that they've, that they've projected, they calculate the magnification, they graph the points. So it's like data collection, graphing, there's algebra to solve the two equations to get the thin lens and also to get the magnification formula. So it's algebra two, um, and then they are essentially building, so it's engineering design. So we asked them, how can you improve this to make it more stable? How can you change it to make it bigger and, and these sorts of things? So trying to get to concepts that are taught in the high school level, um, but giving a hands-on, here's how you would use these abstract, conce abstract concepts like algebra or graphing in something practical. And so you generate that interest um, amongst the students. I, I asked because, if for people that are volunteering, we, we have uh, Optics Outreach Volunteer Group. We're all excited about all these things, but often it, we need some curriculum in place to, to execute on, because um, people, you know, we have limited bandwidth actually. Yeah. If we were to just create all this material, that would take quite a while. But if there's existing resources, and I know there are. I will share my resources. <laughs> exactly, that's something we can then do over the summer, um, just kind of go out and execute on what's already there. Yeah, I think the idea of um, student chapters at like optics, like the SBIE chapters, um, this sort of outreach, um, if the limitation is you don't have the curriculum or the ideas behind it, um, we have the web page which has like YouTube videos of me explaining what to do and the different steps and the parts, and it's relatively cheap. And so I can send you sort of, here's what you need to, to do this specific activity. Yeah. I don't want to cut off conversation, um, but we do have sandwiches in the back. So for everyone here who is planning to stay for the next lecture, yeah. we can continue discussion of what we eat. Yes. I have one more question. Also. Sure. I'm going to uh, put these up just so that you're aware of the other questions that we could talk about. I, have one question. I really like the talk and you know your ideas. Thank you. It just made me think about the same problems in a different way. And I want to pressure this one. Can, will you allow? Uh, to sit down here and let's all take a photo together. Sure. I would sure. love that. Group photo? Yeah. Sure. Yeah, group photo. I would love that. Keep a memory of it. Then we can have lunch. Yeah.
Will you understand? Or do you want to? I am um, we go to each other. Well, in general, I don't think the it's very slight. I have no interest. I definitely want to take a photo. That's a good one. Apparently, the one. Well, this, this, I don't this slide of this box idea is pretty cool to mark. <laughs> The very good way to represent. Sure. So if everyone could come up, we can. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I'm going to next to you. <laughs> what was your name, by the way? Nico. Nico. Yeah. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. It's my pleasure.